I was asked to talk about my research for the essay, but I thought that I didn't really do research as I was understand it. And I haven't actually looked back at my essay, which I delivered, I think, to Eleanor about last September. So it's quite a long time since I wrote it and I haven't read it again. So I'm not talking about my essay. Um, that will come out in the book. But I was, I was kind of provoked to think about research and what research means when you're working with a living artist and how different that is compared to working with artists who are no longer. And Jackie is, in a sense, the kind of elephant in the room because she might have been here and then she decided she didn't want to be here because she thought she would inhibit us talking about her work. And yet I keep feeling that, you know, I want to ask her the question, how did you make that and what did that? And I think it's, to me, in a way, typical of Jackie, which, and it's both frustrating and <laughs> real that she's quite evasive and always kind of maneuvers and manipulates round questions so as to kind of not to give you a real answer or to give you two options of an answer. It can be this or it could be that. Um, and that, that means that you really, in a sense, you, you either go with her and you reflect those diverse options or you have to make your own decision. Okay, well, I think it is about this. And I think in a way that's a challenge that she throws out to us and it hasn't quite been met by anyone yet because she's so adept at weaving in and out. So I thought a bit about uh, research. What does that mean with a living artist? And I think um, it's about meeting them and meeting them over time. So in a way, what I was thinking about was when did I meet her? And where was I at that point? Where was she at that point? And I, I go back to this exhibition in 1996, which was at the Bose Museum not so far from here. Um, and that's when I first met Jackie. So that's nearly 30 years ago. That is a long time, but also it's not so long in terms of a career that is 50 years. So David has known Jackie another 20 years longer than I have. So I feel in many ways like a newcomer, even though it's already 30 years since I met her. But I was a very young curator at this point and made this mixed exhibition with a German colleague in the Bose Museum a set of German artists and a set of British artists. So this, in fact, is Katharina Fritsch on the cover of the book. And we, we worked in very different ways. So Veit Gerner worked to kind of contrast and almost oppose the setting of the, the Bose Museum, was I looked for similarities. So I was quite, I'll just move on actually, I'll move on to this room here, because when I was going around the Bose Museum, looking especially at some of these extremely Victorianate rooms, I was really struck by the density of pattern and texture and how much was happening in one small space and that made me think of Jackie and the work. So you can see there um, some of her painting works and also a piece which picked up on her carpet work which you can't see but on the table is a, one of those Victorian kind of velour tablecloths which is really like some of Jackie's um, carpets. So I thought that was kind of a perfect setting for her. And I, I've always thought that she's very interested and open to being set in different contexts, quite unlike many fine artists of her generation who wanted the white gallery. She was ready to deal with real space and um, the kind of confusion of real space, whether that's domestic or on occasion in a museum. And I also showed this piece here, which she, I remember at the time she said, she was amazed I chose that piece because she thought no one would ever show that piece. She said, people hate this work. They find it very uncomfortable. Um, and this kind of hair and bronze and what is it? And well, what is it doing? And a kind of um, bodily surreal quality that kind of provoked people. And she said she was amazed it was on show. And I put it next to one of the medieval triptychs from the Bose Museum, because I, I thought that was interesting, the kind of reliquary medieval quality, um, the idea of something which maybe has come from a body, but has been severed from the body or preserved, seemed to have this sort of semi-ritualistic medieval quality. So I liked uh, that quality. I think that she uh, is kind of up for the context and also um, ready to collaborate, whether that's with people or with others textures, other patterns, other contexts. 
And then the next time I encountered her really was when she and Laura Ford asked me to write uh, an essay for this show in Camden, Camden Arts Centre in London. That was in 1998. So again, I was struck by the fact that they were, uh, this was a very much a collaborative project. And I think that Jackie is interesting for being open to collaboration. And I think that may again be a reason why she's been slightly neglected over the years because she didn't push the solo image all the time, either of herself or of her work. These kind of images from the catalog, which really overlay one artist onto another, so that's Laura Ford over Jackie Poncelet, or it can be vice versa. She's kind of quietly daring, uh, and I think in a way that was quite, quite unusual um, at that time. Around about the same time, in the late, very late 90s, she came to the Henry Moore Institute to work on a fellowship. And that, that's when I suppose I began to get to know her better because she was there for four weeks. And, but I thought it was interesting that in her fellowship, which later was published in this little essay, short interview with me and her, she used the time and the money from the fellowship to actually work with four other artists. And she invited Susanna Heron and Ewan Henderson, Laura Godfrey Isaacs and Elizabeth Rosser to show their works around the Institute. And we had them uh, not at the time in the galleries, but in our offices and in the library and in non museal spaces. And people were, lots of, all the people, all the staff were asked to accommodate something in their rooms. And then we just lived with them for a month and, and thought about them. So again, that was not a common way of showing people's work. And then finally we did this interview and it only came out in 2000. So it took kind of four years to make this very slim interview happen. And that, again, that was because Jackie kept saying, oh, I don't think I have anything to say or I don't know how to say it or I'm not very articulate. But in a way, this essay is about us proving that you can say it if you do sit down. Um, you can say it, and of course she and she can say it, and it, it was always this um, kind of g game about whether she could say it or not say it. The um, I think that I reread this now just for this talk, and I, I think the gist of it is that she was interested in these four artists because they made works that she thought were amazingly daring because they dared to be ugly, um, and there and she was always pulled back by the fact that she couldn't make things that were ugly. She always wanted to make things that were beautiful, tidy, clean, properly made, um, not looking messy. And she, but she admired these artists. I think this is authentic. She really admired them for being able to go beyond that control that she wants to always retain over her works. And I think that that is something you see in all the works in the show that they are clean, tidy, well-made. And the show itself is kind of clean, tidy and well-made too. It's quite interesting. Um, and yet she has this kind of irritant provocation in this discussion that she wants, she wished she could be more messy. And she was interested, especially in the artists who were working with clay in a way that was so unlike her, allowing clay to be a kind of splodgy, unshaped, unmanaged form. Um, and I think there was a lot of discussion at that time about the abject and the idea of um, the unformed or inform, uh, unformed material. And Jackie was kind of, I think, um, she asking herself why she wouldn't allow her clay to be like that, why it was always managed. So that was, this, this came out in 2000, and I didn't really have an occasion um, to work again with Jackie or to think again about Jackie for quite a long time until I was asked to write for this show, which was both in Yale at the Yale Centre for British Art and then it went to the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge. Things of Beauty Growing. Um, and I wrote an essay called, I think, Communicating Vessels, Why Ceramics Allow Artists to Do Things That Ceramicists Can't or something like that. Um, and this was the first time that I kind of dared to allow myself to think about Jackie's relationship with the man who was her husband for about 25 years, Richard Deacon, 
who is maybe the other elephant in the room, um, a you know, significant artist with whom she shared her life for such a long t time and a, a very formative time from her immediate post-art school days to um, the early 2000s. And of course, who she still sees, but I think this is a really difficult area and one that I haven't been able to research because I can't talk to her about it, um, but I would like to, because I think there's such an interesting give and take between the two, um, but it's something that is still rather unspoken. So I tried in my essay to talk about not just Jackie Ponsley and Richard Deacon, but also about the, what was happening at the time and how there are links between what was happening in ceramics and what was happening in sculpture in the very late 70s, around 1980. And I, I think one thing I did learn in my research for this essay, for the book here, was how lively ceramics was in Britain in the 1970s. Uh, and I wasn't around at that time, I wasn't aware of that at all. Maybe David could talk a bit more about that, but it was, it seemed so much was happening and it was well promoted and displayed and toured and there were a lot of exhibitions and it was an area where you could, you, you can now see um, an amazing creativity, an amazing thinking outside the box, and of course a lot of very strong woman artists. You know, and to what extent that was because woman artists weren't able to work in another area or wanted to work in ceramics, that's, a, that's obviously a, a question to think about. The, the key relationship that I would like to explore and haven't yet is this relationship between Jackie working on the inside and the outside of a form and opening up that form in a way that I suppose you might say goes back to Barbara Hepworth in sculpture. But Jackie made it happen so flexibly and creatively within ceramics. And then the drawings that Richard Deacon was making at the same time in New York that became the Orpheus drawings, which I think really, I think you could say they made his name and were immediately bought by the Tate is huge drawings of the interior exterior forms. And there's very, very interesting, as you can see, I think visual parallels between her ceramics and his drawings. Um, and you might almost think they were her drawings. So this, these are more or less contemporary in time. You're thinking about how you imagine the inside of the form and the fact that her clay Many of the clay works, ceramic works at this point are not, they don't have an applied surface. The surface is part of the form, part of the material. So it, that interior exterior, which is not applied, but integral is very interesting, I think. And it's something you might see also in Barbara Hepworth that it's one, one form, one material gives you the interior and the exterior. I suppose another difference would be that her, her ceramic works from at this point are relatively small and Richard Deacon began to make very large sculptures at this point. So there's a, there is a difference in scale. The similarities are perhaps closer on the screen than they are in, in real life. But nevertheless, they're very interesting. And I would love to know what was happening in that New York studio at that time, around 1978, 79, 80. And David followed on from Jackie at that time. So you actually know what that studio was like in that context. But it seemed to me that something very extraordinary happened there. Um, and Richard Deacon's drawings, I think, um, really set him on a path that he followed for a really long period, uh, in fact, longer than Jackie. And that interior exterior, to me, relates back to what he must have seen and learned from her as a, someone making ceramics. So that, in a way, that is what I'd most like to research, but I feel I can't do it because if I start to approach Jackie on this question, I can see that she doesn't want to talk about it. And same with Richard. Um, so I don't know if I'll ever be able to, but I don't want to make um, kind of superficial speculations. I'd like to really understand what they learned from each other. And I, and I don't, I don't really know. So that's, that's a kind of more, that's, in a way that's saying, this is the research I haven't done. And I don't know if I can do. But also I'll move on to um, some observations about the kind of context of thinking about Jackie's work. 
the next... Well, that's, so that's, that's the kind of work that Richard went on, I think, that came out of those drawings. That's from 1985. That's also in the Tate collection. And in a way, when I began, I began working in Tate Liverpool in 1988, and the first show that we worked on there was a show called Starlit Waters about contemporary British sculpture. And Richard Deacon, Tony Cragg, Anthony Gormley, they were all the stars of the show. No one ever mentioned Jackie Poncelet at that time. Um, it took me another 10 years to even discover that she existed. Um, so in terms of that kind of timing, I, I think when I first encountered her work, I came to it when she'd abandoned ceramics and had started making sculpture. I didn't know at the time that this was the, a really quite a short period when she was making sculpture. It didn't last very long, but I came to her as a young curator without any kind of preconception. So I didn't know her as a famous ceramicist. I later discovered that a lot of people um, would continually lament the fact that she'd stopped making ceramics because they thought her ceramics were so lovely. And they said, well, I don't know why she's trying to make sculpture, you know, you know, as if it was absolutely ridiculous. And it's only been gradually, I'd say, over the last 10 years that I've begun to see those sculptures that she made. But she was, for better or for worse, whether it was through her or through other people, whether it was through people's blindness or it's a complicated network of, you know, why things happen and don't happen. But I was, when I've seen these works, I think they're really extraordinary. And I can't see any good reason why they couldn't have been included in those exhibitions because they were as interesting and provocative and multifarious as any of those things that were called objects and sculptures around 1980. It would be easy to say it's because she was seen as a ceramicist, but I don't know if that's just the reason. So recently I wrote a very short piece for this uh, catalogue. It was a touring show of the Arts Council. So now I'm in 2020. Um, Natalie Judd was the curator of the sculpture collection at that time and she really poured through the collection to work out, to bring out as many sculptures by woman as she could since 1945. And I was struck that again, Jackie's not in this show. <laughs> and that's quite a, a rather recent show and she could easily have been in it. And I suppose that's because the Arts Council wasn't collecting Jackie's sculptures. They, the Crafts Council was collecting Jackie's ceramics. So there isn't, uh, perhaps the work that there might have been in the collection for her to think about this. And then one artist who kind of jumped out at me, who is in this book and in, was in the show, is Margaret Organ. And Margaret Organ, who's similarly disappeared from view really, um, was a sculptor, a female sculptor who kind of had visibility um, in the late 70s. And this is a piece that was made in 1976 and remade in 2014. And I think the Arts Council bought it in 2016. But she was in some of those famous exhibitions, including the one in the ICA Objects and Sculpture. Um, you can see her pieces there. So th this exhibition, I think when I began working as a sculpture curator, this was a kind of canonical show from 1981. It was in the Arnolfini and the ICA, and it showcased a new generation of sculptors. So that would be um, Cragg and Allington and Gormley and Deacon. Uh, and the, really the unexpected extra is Margaret Organ, who was in that show as well. Um, and one or two other people who maybe weren't, who haven't fared quite so well, like Jean-Luc Jean Villemut um, and Ed Allington. But you can see, uh, you can see the back Bill Woodrow as well. So, you can see how heterogeneous it is. And in a way you would say that was a generous show. It allowed many kinds of sculpture to be there, but it didn't allow Jackie Poncelet to be there. Um, and I suppose I'm you know, thinking now about this, the repetition of forms and you know, strange objects on the ground, twisting objects, all those kinds of things that you see downstairs. But it's interesting that she wasn't there. Um, and yet artists like Ed Allington, you know, 
who, who was there was thinking about things very like Jackie, I would say, in the, the way that forms repeat or don't, or are vari variations of forms. Also the way that they sit on a mat or a floor. This was something that Jackie was exploring shortly in terms of her sculpture, trying to find a way to uh, avoid the plinth, but protect the sculpture and give it a special place. A bit like Alison Wilding as well, in a way to kind of find a way to give sculpture its own place. So if you think this is the, this maybe is the piece that you didn't get from the Tate, I think. Is that right? Um, so I think that there's an interesting parallel there between Ed Allington and Jackie Poncelet, um, and they're very similar in period. But this work, I can actually say that I helped to acquire it for the Tate, but that was you know, nearly 20 years later after it was made. So again, you see a very different institutional process that Richard Deacon was being acquired by the Tate almost as soon as he made the works. And this, it took this to about nearly 20 years for this to go into the Tate collection. And then you couldn't borrow it. But the more I have found or had the chance to look at Jackie's sculptures from this period, I've, I think it's remarkable that she wasn't in these shows. And what would have, how different would her career have been if she had been in those shows? If she had been incorporated into that big sculptural swing in Britain around 1981, 82, 83, there was also a big show called, uh, I think it was called Figures and Sculptures at the John Hansard Gallery. Is that the right title? Um, those two shows really kind of created a group of artists who were toured all over Europe and America by the British Council. Um, and she wasn't in it. And I, and I think her sculptures really are as good as any of one, any of the others. And, I, and it's this question, is it to do with gender? I think not. I think it's probably more to do with medium and that she was still seen as a ceramicist. And I, I remember encountering people who see, mainly seemed to be focused on their regret that she was not still a ceramicist. And they couldn't, just couldn't get their head around that she might be a sculptor. And I understand now why that period in her work didn't really last very long. And I, I think that she felt she just couldn't find purchase or uh, find a way in. And yet I think now we had the chance to think back um, at what she was doing and realize that she could have added a very interesting element, interesting dimension to the way that British sculpture was seen in the eighties. And that kind of multiplicity of form, um, 2D, 3D, the shapes and so on, really do something quite extraordinary. This is a photograph that David took, I think, in 1981 of the young Jackie Poncelet. So about this time, this woman is making works like this. And I think that possibly it's um, the, I think what is so unusual about her work and now it's maybe easier for us to digest, but perhaps kind of rub people up the wrong way, <laughs> almost literally in, at that point 40 years ago, is was actually too sexual. And the, you know, it's figurative, but it's not obviously figurative. And what's, what it's doing is something that is very kind of visceral and bodily and related to movement, but also related to pleasure and pain. And that's not happening in other British sculptures so much, obviously, at the time. It seems to me that this kind of, this is almost uncomfortably physical. And figurative sculpture wasn't happening very much anyway, but if it was happening, it was happening in different ways. And I think that somehow Jackie's is more internal and more, 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 more real, let's say. So I'm pleased that you've got some of these pieces here. Well, I think what I'd really love to see would be a show of all those sculptural works. Though unfortunately, I think she destroyed a number, she told me, and I think that was to do with frustration. Um, but to, sh to see all the works that she made at this time and maybe also look at them in relation to what was happening um, 
more widely uh, in sculpture, not just in Britain, but elsewhere, maybe particularly in America. But I think she was really onto something, and that, but she lost that moment and there wasn't a recognition. And now we're looking at it 40 years later. Um, and I mean, I'm glad that we are and can, but it, it seems, I think, all too clear that this should have been recognized more strongly for what it was at the time. Because if we think about who was making figurative sculpture in the 80s, it would be someone like Anthony Gormley. He was always, in a way, standing out uh, aside from the others because it was clearly figurative. But it was, in my view, not sexual. Not, although he might talk about that, it's, it doesn't have that physicality and carnality that, that Jackie's sculptures have. And then another artist, I think, who would be interesting for me and us to find out more about who she, I know, was close to and showed with very early on in her career, is Glenis Barton. This is from 1974, and they had a joint show together. I think it was one of Jackie's very first shows, or maybe second show. Um, and this was the kind of work that Glenis Barton was showing. So it, it's ceramics and it's figurative, but it, it, to me, it's more like Anthony Gormley. It is like Anthony Gormley than it is like Jackie Ponsley. And Jackie Ponsley, can be shown so easily, I would say, um, with contemporary artists, really young contemporary artists working now. Um, so that would be another interesting show to look at, is how, how this kind of work relates to what artists in their 20s and 30s are making now in Britain. And it, I think that she really was a kind of um, avatar and quite unrecognised in that. It's great to be able to see this now, but of course there is a kind of tinge of regret, really. Um, and how that how the history might have been different. I've got a, the, my last picture. It doesn't really. It's just a kind of coda. That's the um, the exhibition that she made. Jackie made in the New Art Centre about three years ago, I think. Yeah. Um, again, showing that plurality and heterogeneity of work. And but I think an, an artist who is kind of still waiting to be described. Let's say and um, artists who can be described seem to always get into art history more quickly than the artists who can't be described. So that's me, thank you. Thank you.